Are you the kind of person who likes to multitask while enjoying your true crime? Maybe you like to listen while you drive to work, take a walk, or cook? Then you'll be happy to hear that A Memory of Malice is also a podcast. This episode is not intended for children. No harm is intended to the victims described in this episode or their families. This episode is intended for educational purposes. Content Warnings This episode covers heavy subject matter and includes serious content warnings, including sexual assault, including that of a child, sexual assault that includes anal activity, incest, domestic violence and abuse, child abuse and neglect, strangulation, mentions of Nazi symbols and white supremacist groups, heavy drug use, brief mentions of suicide, desecration of a dead body, and general misogyny. Please, if any of the previous are triggers for you, come back for another episode. Like I said last episode, there's never any shortage of true crime. Hello loves. Not a lot of pre-K stuff. I will apologize to the YouTube viewers. I realized I goofed and forgot to add any scene transitions to the video, so that must have been a really pleasant viewing experience. Hopefully I won't be forced to edit another video while half asleep again. But onwards with the official last part of Marlowe and Kaufman. On May 11th, 1956, a premature baby was born in a Cincinnati hospital. The mother, a 17-year-old, didn't seem very excited over her new baby, but her reaction looked like adoration compared to the total indifference of the baby's father. If he was excited to have a son, he didn't show it. The girl's name had once been Doris Walls, before she got pregnant by a boy who also lived in an impoverished area of McCreary County, Kentucky. Jeffrey Marlowe had married her, and he'd moved them all to Ohio in search of work. The newborn baby was James Gregory Marlowe, and this would be the most peaceful and least tumultuous time of his entire young life. Doris's habits of hard partying and drug use put a strain on her marriage with Jeffrey, who had bad habits of his own. It wouldn't be long before their young relationship would crack. Doris packed up two-year-old Marlo and carried him back home to Kentucky, where she would stay with her mother. It didn't take her long to find someone else. Doris was a beautiful woman, known for her brown hair and long red nails. A preacher in a nearby town, whom the book referred to as Donald Bender, fell for her, and they married in 1958. A year later, the pair would have baby Veronica. Marlowe had always been a victim of neglect, whether by his mother's poor parenting or the lack of resources available to those in McCreary County. But now he would be singled out for his stepfather's physical abuse. In Property of the Fulsome Wolf, Lassiter describes how Bender would verbally and physically abuse the young child. From the book, he would cram him into the space beneath the sink and force him to stay there for hours at a time. I'm uncertain of his exact age during this, but it happened during a four-year span from when he was anywhere from two to six years old. The physical and emotional abuse only compounded the serious neglect both children experienced. Money was tight in the area, and nourishing food was scarce. It was common to see children suffering from diseases caused by malnutrition. Marlowe's teeth rotted, and Veronica developed chronic kidney disease. In response to the desperation of the area, bootlegging whiskey and weed became a common occurrence. Doris was thrilled, not that she was worried about providing for her children, a rougher crowd of bikers moving to the area thrilled Doris because now she had someone to party with. In one memorable instance, she took her children over to her friend's house and left them there to be watched over. She left her friend a quart of milk so they wouldn't be a burden. She didn't retrieve her children for two weeks. Once again, Doris's hell raising put a strain on her marriage. She and Donald would often have tumultuous fights. He had shot her, and she had stabbed him seven times. I don't know if the shooting and stabbings happened at the same time, 
She would even try to run him over with her car, a tactic that is familiar to those who know Cynthia Kaufman's history with Doug Huntley. In 1962, she and Donald divorced. She took the children and went back to her mother's, but she couldn't afford to raise both of them. Not even in the neglectful fashion she had been doing all along. She sent Marlowe away to live with his father. Jeffrey Marlowe had moved from Cincinnati to Vermilion, Ohio, where he lived with his new wife and children. Coincidentally, the same day young Marlowe disembarked the Greyhound bus to meet his father, Jeffrey's wife Anita was giving birth. His father took him to the hospital so he could meet his new stepmother. Anita Marlowe described how he looked when she first saw him. His clothes were old and threadbare, his shoes falling apart, and his mouth was full of sores and rotten teeth. Unlike every other adult in Marlowe's brief life, Anita took pity on him. She said he was a lonely, lost little boy wanting somebody to love him. And so she would. Even though Anita had two other children and a new baby, she took Marlo right in hand. Anita enrolled Marlo in school. She even took him to the dentist twice a week to fix his teeth. The six-year-old seemed to be happy. But certain patterns seemed to repeat in James Gregory Marlowe's life. And though his father seemed accepting, excited even, of his presence, his son soon became the target of his wrath. Nothing the child did was right. Jeffrey slapped and spanked Marlowe for everything, from eating incorrectly to being rude. The abuse would only increase when Jeffrey drank, and he drank often. Later, Anita would say, that man should never have been a father. Even with this toxic home environment, Marlowe was thriving under his stepmother's care. It seemed like he had finally found a place where he could feel loved and happy. In February of 1963, Marlowe was told that he was to go to the office because he was being picked up for his dental appointment. I don't know why he didn't try to ask for help from anyone in the office when he realized the woman standing there wasn't Anita but he quietly went along without making a fuss. Doris Walls had come to collect her son, and she wasted no time in taking him back to Kentucky. Anita and Jeffrey reported him as a missing child, but the authorities didn't take custodial kidnapping very seriously back then, and just didn't do anything about it. Marlowe found himself back in Kentucky with his mother, sister, grandmother, and assorted other relatives. He even attended school for a while, until the Walls decided they needed to pack up and move to California. Doris and a relative stole Donald Bender's car on the way and sank it in the Cumberland River. It was probably in return for some violence perpetrated against her at some point. Considering she didn't try to do bodily harm, sinking a car is fairly tame. After this act of revenge was finished, the extended Walls family piled into two cars and drove the 2,000 miles to Southern California. This trip would later be eerily echoed by Marlowe and Kaufman in 1986. Financially, things were slightly better for the family in SoCal. They qualified for welfare assistance, which kept them fed at the very least. But the neglect continued for Marlo and Veronica. Doris leaned even harder into the party scene, getting mixed up with harder and harder drugs. She eventually ended up a regular user of LSD, cocaine, and heroin. She would disappear for long periods, and the children would rubber band between foster homes and their grandmothers. When Doris managed to hold on to an apartment for a while, her children would stay with her. But this was hardly an ideal situation. She would often hold parties in her home, in which men with money or drugs would come over. She would take drugs and have sex, often in view of the kids. When the police raided the apartment, she would use her children to hide her stash once sitting Veronica on top of a box full of drugs. She felt no compunction about leading her young son into a life of crime. 
When asked about his mom, Marlow said a lot of very revealing things. The following quote is a bit long, but I felt it tells you a lot about Marlow and Doris' relationship. It says, I loved my mother. When I was just a little guy, we did robberies and burglaries and stuff. She used to take me to these big parties. I mean, East L.A. and Hollywood. And man, everybody would go in these big rooms and do heroin and stuff. And I would pretend like I was sick until they were gone. And then I'd get up and I'd hit the jewelry and money, and I'd run out to the car and put it in my mom's stash spot. We had an old car, and I'd put it in the trunk. They, meaning Doris and her friends, they used to put me through holes in the roof of stores and stuff. I used to go through the little windows and houses and get a chair so I could unlock the door. They showed me how to unlock the doors, and they'd come in and steal everything. I just wanted to do good, and every time Mom left, I thought it was because I didn't do good enough. I tried to figure out what I did wrong. If I could just do better the next time, maybe she'll stay, or maybe she'll take me with her. So I always tried to do better, and I'd practice, and I did real good on Robin and Stealin. We didn't necessarily hurt anybody. We survived. She had to have her drugs, and we had to have food, pay rent, and other things. That's just the way it was. This unhealthy situation would continue until Marla was 13, and Child Welfare asked Jeffrey and Anita to take him in again. Anita wanted to help him, but she was worried that Jeffrey's earlier abuse would continue. Nevertheless, she agreed to take him. Anita's worries had been right. Jeffrey's drinking had never stopped, and his abuse only got worse. He would strike his son with belts and switches, leaving him with welts and bruises that would cover his backside and all down his legs. At this point, Marlowe wasn't alone in his abuse. His half-brother was also regularly beaten, and Jeffrey beat and sexually assaulted his daughters. Anita couldn't stay with her husband any longer, and she made plans to leave him. But before she did, she contacted social services and made arrangements for Marlowe to be put in another foster home. She couldn't take him with her when she left his father, but she could try to protect him by getting him to a safe environment. Unfortunately, a few weeks later, she was told that someone had retrieved him from the foster home and taken him away. Doris had again retrieved her son. When Marlowe returned to California with his mother, his abuse was taken to another disturbing level. He was raped by his own mother. Marlowe didn't know that this was inappropriate at the time. He said, Yeah, I didn't even know it was sex with my mother, he said. It was, it seemed so normal. It seemed so normal to me. I didn't know that anybody else didn't do that. I didn't know it was wrong. I'm just from another area. We have this area out here, and people in this area have certain ways of doing things, and these people out here have other ways. It even happens with kids. Put kids in certain areas, and they grow up and act in certain ways. In addition to sexually assaulting a 13-year-old, his mother also would regularly inject him with heroin. This is a major turning point in Marlowe's life a clear delineation between the child he was and the man he would become. And, I have to reiterate this, he's only 13. After this, his life began a downhill trajectory. He kept getting into more and more trouble, the kind of trouble you get arrested for. He had been committing a string of robberies and drug offenses, bouncing in and out of jail. Somehow, every time he was arrested, Marlowe and his mother convinced his parole officers, sometimes the same parole officer multiple times, that he wanted to turn his life around and that he wanted to do better. Time after time, he was released onto the streets. No specific date for the following is mentioned, but it seems that it happened sometime during 1970 when Marlowe would be about 14. He met a 19-year-old woman who would end up becoming his first wife. We'll call her Connie, because that's what the book calls her, but I'm fairly certain this is a fake name. Marlo and Connie would live together. 
They often freeloaded at Grandma Walls' house. Though Connie had a job as an exotic dancer, she already had children of her own to support in addition to Marlo. Still, they stayed together, even having a baby in 1973. Doris was tired of her life in California. She convinced Veronica to move back with her to Kentucky by telling her she'd never use drugs again. The pair left, not even telling Marlo they were leaving. The next month, Marlo and Connie got married. Connie was the only one of the pair making any money, and that money went to a round of increasingly harder drugs. Connie was annoyed that Marlo didn't have a job, enough so that she threatened to leave him if he didn't get one. Surprisingly, Marlo complied. He got a job in a shoe store. Unsurprisingly, he only lasted three weeks. He went back to burglary instead. He was arrested for drug possession and burglary, and a fed-up Connie left him to move in with her parents. Anyway, Marlo got parole again, and it was during this time that he learned that his beloved mother had died in a trailer fire. He did not take the news well. He paid for her body to be flown to California, and he demanded to see it because he needed proof that she was dead. The book described him as hysterical. Marlowe's life fell apart after this. He began being arrested more and more frequently. On the day that Connie gave birth to his next children, twins, he was burglarizing a house. He started hanging out with a guy named Richard Drinkhouse. Drinkhouse was the sister of a girl Marlo was dating at the time. Marlo even got on well with their mother, who he would smoke pot with. Living next door at the time was a girl. This girl's name might be an alias in the source material, but just to be on the safe side, I'm gonna call her D. I I feel like she would want her privacy. On a lovely spring day, Dee, her parents, the drink houses, and Marlo were all hanging out in front of their homes. Out of the blue, Marlo said he was going to go buy some beer at the convenience store. He asked Dee if she'd like to go along. Dee agreed, and she blithely got into his car. They did head towards the convenience store, but before they got there, Marlo pulled up at a trashy house. Confused, Dee asked why they were stopping there. Marlo told her he needed to go inside and talk with someone, and asked her to come with him. Dee initially said no, but Marlo kept asking, so she relented and agreed to come in with him. As they approached the door, Dee in front and Marlo behind, she felt that something was wrong. The house just felt abandoned. Maybe because she couldn't hear any sounds, or perhaps because there were no lights on. As she tried to turn to ask Marlo what was up, she was bashed over the head and dragged inside the house. There, she was beaten until she lost consciousness. She woke in a small, dark space, a closet, and she had been bound and gagged. For three days, she was anally raped and continually beaten. Marlo's temperament would change wildly from violent and cruel to tearful and apologetic, almost like a light switch had been thrown. Finally, Marlo untied her and told her to get dressed, because he would take her home. Dee didn't believe this for a second and used her new freedom to kick him in the nuts and run for it. She ran until she reached a friend's house to take refuge. Coincidentally, this friend and her husband were the same people that Marlowe had burglarized not too long ago. Marlowe had threatened them against contacting the police, but upon seeing her brutalized friend, the wife was filled with rage. Dee was too afraid to make a report, but the woman reported the burglary instead. Marlowe was arrested that evening and this time his parole officer recommended giving him over to the California Youth Authority, or CYA. Unfortunately, during his time at CYA, he managed to manipulate a psychiatrist with sob stories, and he ended up being paroled into drug rehab. 
He was released in seven months. After a few more brushes with the law, Marla returned to live with relatives in Kentucky. Here, he met the woman who would become his second wife, Jennifer. They only went on two dates, but she fell for him so hard that she even kept visiting him when he was in jail. She even brought him gifts and did his laundry for him. Marlowe began to weaponize his sad childhood at this point. He told Jenny, and every woman who would come after, about his terrible past. This is very clearly a manipulation tactic. And it works for him every goddamn time. It worked so well on Jenny that she got her father to pay Marlowe's bail so he could get out of jail. The next day, December 14th, 1977, the two were married and the pair moved to Indianapolis. The domestic violence began almost immediately. Marlowe would become irrationally jealous of anyone and everyone in Jenny's sphere. A man lived with him at the time, and, believing that Jenny was cheating on him with the roommate, Marlowe slashed Jenny in a jealous rage on her shoulder and arm. The damage would take four hours of surgery to repair. He would frequently love bomb her after the abuse, apologizing and doing kind things for her. The usual abusive partner pattern. This cycle would continue for the entirety of the marriage. When Ginny became pregnant, the pair moved back to Kentucky to stay with her grandparents. Around this time, Marlowe began trying to threaten Ginny to move back with him to Pine Knot or Stearns, closer to his home base and taking her away from any support she might have. Ginny got fed up one evening. She stabbed herself with a pair of scissors two inches deep into her leg and declared, You're not going to make me do anything because whatever you can do to me, I can do to myself. Marlo just looked at her and then left. When Jenny limped bleeding out of the bathroom, her father saw her and lost it. Assuming that Marlo had done this to his daughter, he grabbed his gun and left the house. Though the wound wasn't fatal, her father did shoot Marlo that day. Marlo attempted to see Jenny again, but was scared off by the presence of her father in the home. He fled back to his biker friends and Pine Knot and Stearns. He stayed there until he once again got an urge to tread the familiar path to California. I was surprised while doing my research that he's still only 23 at this point. With all the things he'd done and had done to him, I felt like he had to be older. Still, Marla was spending around 300 bucks a day to feed his heroin habit. Seeing as he could never keep a job for more than a few weeks at a time, this meant he had to get creative. He met up with another man named Tinley, and the pair made plans to rob an apartment rumored to have a stash of money and drugs. However, the pair of absolute geniuses robbed the wrong apartment building. They terrorized not one, but two different units before they cut their losses and ran. Bizarrely, Marlowe's plan following this was to rob a store called Leather Mart, which sold all different sorts of leather and animal hide goods. Directly after the failed apartment robbery, he strode into the store with a gun and told the female employees to get down on their knees. When they complied, he stole 75 bucks from the cash register and two coats. One rabbit fur coat and one leather coat. He then left the store. Tinley and Marlowe didn't make another move for a few weeks until desperation had begun to kick in. They knew of a methadone clinic nearby, and they planned to rob it so they could get some relief from withdrawal. This plan worked. They held a gun on the terrified staff of the clinic and managed to escape with a 10,000 milligram bottle of methadone. By the time the police tracked them down and arrested them a few days later, half of the bottle had disappeared. This time, Marla would not escape prison. 
He was identified in multiple lineups as the man who tried to rob the two apartments and who had succeeded in robbing the Leathermarked and Methadone Clinic. He took a deal and agreed to plead guilty to armed robbery. Marlowe was sentenced to Duell Vocational Institute for five years. And almost immediately, Marlowe managed to meet another woman. Beverly wasn't even visiting Marlowe when she met him, but he spun her the sad story of his life, and she was hooked. A fact about Beverly that he probably found even more attractive was that she was facing charges for shooting a woman with a handgun. She probably reminded him of his mother. Within a month of meeting Marlowe, Beverly brought a reverend with her to visit him, and she had them married right there. Unfortunately for the newlyweds, Marlowe kept screwing up their chances for contact visits. A contact visit is a visit with an inmate where you can sit together with no barriers. He kept breaking the rules and getting into fights, which took away his privileges. And when the prison did allow a contact visit, they found that Marlowe had contraband on him immediately after it. In 1982, Marlowe was stabbed multiple times by an inmate. The prison wanted him to testify against his attacker, but he refused. As punishment, it was decided that he would be sent to Folsom Prison, one of California's toughest prisons. It was in Folsom that most of the mythos surrounding Marlowe would originate. To better survive in Folsom, Marlowe buddied up to the Aryan Brotherhood. His cellmate would give him most of his tattoos during his stay, starting with a flaming swastika. Marlowe would later try to distance himself from the Aryan Brotherhood, but no dice. In my book, if you proudly wear a swastika on your body, you're a friggin' Nazi. He ended up with many tattoos. The Vikings, a skull, and disgustingly, Beverly's name on his penis. And if I had to sit with that imagery while researching this, so do you. Let's spread the gross around. However, the tattoo that he's most famously known for was a snarling wolf on his side, from which he got the prison nickname Folsom Wolf. Many people refer to the later murders as the Folsom Wolf murders, but as you can see, I prefer not to. Not the least because he has to enjoy that. He was released from prison just 10 days before he would turn 27. Of his behavior, Beverly said, the first few months it was, everything was fine. He didn't do any drugs. He wanted a real chance at a real life, you know, with a family and everything. He always had a job. He worked, no drugs, no alcohol. He spent a lot of his time lifting weights. This wouldn't last. The violence began on a Halloween night. Beverly was annoyed he had dressed up as a half-naked Conan the Barbarian, so she playfully smacked him. He struck Beverly so hard in the ribs that she was thrown to the ground and had to visit the doctor. During November, he began forcing her to take death walks. He would drag her down the street from her mother's home, where the two of them lived, until they reached the edge of the desert and hold a knife on her. He would hold the weapon in such a way that it would cut through her clothes and rest right above her kidneys without breaking the skin. During these walks, he would berate and threaten her. Beverly would be terrified until Marlowe eventually dragged her home. They would repeat these walks more than 20 times during the following month. One night, Marlowe turned into what Beverly referred to as the monster. He beat her, threatened to kill her, and eventually raped her with the sword he had used as part of his Halloween costume some time before. He continued his torture by threatening to slice up her face with a razor blade. Beverly's breaking point came later, in March 1986. Marlowe hadn't come home that evening, so she decided to track him down. She found him drinking in a bar with his boss. Irritated, she ignored him when he tried to introduce his boss to her, and she walked away from him. She was just exiting the bar when Marlowe caught up to her. He kicked her down the stairs of the bar and continued kicking her where she landed. When he'd had enough of that assault, he dragged her to his truck and threw her inside. 
As Marlo attempted to drive away with her, she managed to kick the door open and flee for her life. She hid out at a domestic violence shelter for the following two weeks before hiring a rental truck and going to pack her things up from her mother's home. She was still there when Marlo came back. She barely escaped him, slamming the door in his face. He pounded on the door for a while, but he eventually left. When Beverly came out, she realized he had stolen her car keys, the title to her car, and driven off in it. Resigned, she reported the theft and drove off in the rental truck to her new home. That evening, police would arrest Marlow for vehicle theft and take him to Barstow Jail. His cellmate was a man named Doug Huntley. The two men were amused by the sound of a woman in another area cursing out the police officers handling her. That's my honey, Huntley said. I might even marry her one of these days. The fact that Marlo was so attracted to Kaufman was pretty much a no-brainer. She was very similar to his beloved mother, after all. Physically, they were similar in their long, dark hair and attractive looks. They both had drug problems, though Kaufman's addiction was less intense than Doris's when she first met Marlo. He quickly escalated her addiction. Like Doris, Kaufman had a child but didn't take care of him. Though Kaufman wasn't a neglectful mother like Doris was, she wanted her son while Doris couldn't have cared less. The two women were quite alike on a surface level. So it's not surprising he went after Kaufman. He was even sneaky about it. Huntley was released from jail and Marlowe arranged to buy some pot from him. Doug took his money, but dithered about giving him the weed. An angry Marlowe confronted him and demanded his money back. After this, he used the situation to feel out Kaufman on her feelings towards Doug, to see how attached she was to him. Of course, no romance attempt would be complete without his sad backstory. This is eventually what got Kaufman to sleep with him. I won't go over a lot of the same info from the last episode, because that would be boring, but there are several things we'll focus on, because when two liars tell you a tale, there's going to be two versions of everything. Most of their journey towards Pine Knot was told similarly, but things do start to diverge when they reach Kaufman's grandmother's house in St. Louis. Remember the tale Kaufman told? How Marla refused to allow her to get her son from her in-laws and take him with them? Marlowe's version goes like this. Kaufman talked to her parents on the phone and was visibly distraught. In the morning, she was still upset. Her and I talked about it in the bedroom. She said she didn't want to go over there. We decided to come back at another time when we didn't have the stolen car and get him another time. That was Cindy's idea. So she borrowed $10 from her grandmother because we were out of money again, and we took off to Kentucky. A small story to disagree on, but we're only getting started. The truth probably lies somewhere in the middle, but knowing them both can help you learn some interesting things. After arriving in Pine Knot and boozing it up at Lardo's 4th of July party, Marlo received the job to kill Wildman Hill from Killer. He went back home to discuss the idea with Kaufman. Unlike Kaufman's story, where she was unsurprised but unhappy to be involved, Marlowe attested that she was the one who decided to take the job. Even while he attempted to tell her it was a better idea to wait for the job in Atlanta to make some money, Kaufman preferred the idea of getting easy money fast. He eventually replied, Heck with it then. Let's go out there and take a look at it. Examining these two stories gets more interesting with a little more context, so we'll hold off on a discussion of them for now and move on. Most of the killing of Wildman Hill, as told by Marlow, matches up with Kaufman's account, until the very end. The pair headed out to the holler and drove to the top of the hill and spied on Hill in the midst of the cemetery there, with intermittent bang sessions. It's when you get to the meat of it that the story changes. Kaufman's account says that Marlowe forced her to take her top and bra off and lure Hill out to the cemetery. 
but Marlo says that he chickened out at the last minute instead. An annoyed Kaufman took his gun, hid it in the back of her jeans, and changed into the bandana herself. While hiding in the vegetation, he saw Hill arrive and begin looking under the hood. He could also clearly see Kaufman trying to aim the gun at Hill, but being unable to get a clear shot. It was then that Marlowe rushed out of the brush and the fight with Hill over the gun ensued. No matter which story is true, the result was the same. Hill ended up dead in that lonely cemetery. As for the majority of the stories of abuse that Kaufman told, they went either uncontested or nobody bothered to waste any ink on Marlowe's versions. Truth be told, it's fairly obvious that there was domestic violence in their relationship. The only question remains as to the degree and the effect it had upon Kaufman, but I'm getting ahead of myself now. There were at least two incidents where Marlowe had his own conflicting account about an abusive event. One of these was the famous haircutting incident. Marlo didn't deny that he'd gotten jealous of Kaufman in the bar that night. He would say that she was flirting, and it had made him lose his temper. He also confirmed that he had dragged her out of the restaurant by her hair, but he swore that he didn't beat her, terrorize her, or rape her that evening. He said that when they returned back to the hotel room, they were both drunk. Kaufman told him he didn't dare cut her hair even handing him the scissors, and so he did cut it. When he woke in the morning, he told how he felt terrible about the whole thing. Before we move on to this next story, it's probably time to talk about that hit in Phoenix. Kaufman's story tells us that Marlowe was the driving force behind this contract killing of a pregnant woman in Phoenix. She says he brought it up first, that he kept bringing it up, that it was always his idea to try and find a way to Phoenix. But in Marlowe's version of the story, the pair learned about the hit while they were still in Kentucky, not around Paige. He wanted to pass, but Kaufman was excited by the idea. So excited, in fact, that she kept prodding him about it constantly. On October 30th, 1986, Kaufman was once again bringing it up. Marlowe says he was so frustrated that he stabbed his knife into the bed, not knowing Kaufman's leg was there. He completely denied ever telling her that the pills he gave her were cyanide. Are there contrasting stories about the murders? You bet your ass there are. However, we're going to jump ahead of all of that for now. How's Kaufman doing in that interview? What's she saying? Let's see. Kaufman was describing to Detective Smith and Hooper what had happened when they had abducted and murdered Green and Ovis and Linnell Murray. She was open with them, describing how she had put the duct tape on Linnell's mouth, while Marlowe had held her head by the hair. When Smith asked if she had to threaten Linnell to get the pen, she replied, Sure did. She further described the shower Marlowe had taken with Novus. When asked how long they were in the shower, this was her answer. Five, ten minutes at the most. He was in the shower, and she was standing against the wall like this. Then she stood against the wall to demonstrate. The detectives attempted to get Kaufman to point out the area where Karina had been buried, but she didn't show them anything. Eventually, they leveraged her love for her son against her. Later, Kaufman would quote them as saying, How would you feel if he was missing and you didn't know where he was? Wouldn't you want to know if he was dead or alive, one or the other? She cracked and gave them the general area where they had buried Novus. She even agreed to help them find it. Detectives Hooper, Lockhart, and Smith drove Kaufman to the vineyard where Karina's body had been hidden. While the detectives and policemen searched the area, Lockhart stayed behind to question Kaufman in the car. Lockhart asked her to describe what had happened when they reached the vineyard with Karina. Had she been scared or pleading with them? What had she been wearing? Did Kaufman hear anything? How did she think Novus had been killed? Kaufman said that Novus had been wearing a black and green striped blouse and black pants, and she hadn't seemed frightened. She'd only wanted them to be careful with her car. 
She hadn't heard a shot or anything from the vineyard, but she assumed that he'd strangled her. In answer to further questions, she said she didn't think Marlow had raped Karina in the field. He, quote, wouldn't do that. She said when he came back from burying her, he said the ground was hard and he didn't bury her very deep. Meanwhile, detectives in the field were searching for the body of Novus. One of them noticed an area where the vines were conspicuously dead. When they looked at the ground in that area, it had obviously been disturbed recently. When they reached down to scoop away the dirt, they revealed a small, upturned hand with red fingernails. Back at Redlands Police, Detective Fitzmaurice had lost his patience with Marlowe's evasiveness. He finally asked him right out why Karina had to die. Marlowe answered him with a haunted look. I didn't want to kill that girl. When pressed, he admitted it had been that Kaufman and he decided that they couldn't leave witnesses behind. He insisted that he and Kaufman were involved in crimes 50-50. He pointed out that he had never killed before she had joined him. Something difficult to prove or disprove, given that he had claimed to have killed a man in prison for money before he and Kaufman had met. When asked who strangled Novus, he replied, I did, some. The implication here is clear. Kaufman helped him to strangle Karina. Marlowe also confessed to Linnell's murder, describing it in detail for the next hour. I mentioned in the last episode that both Marlowe and Kaufman's Miranda rights were violated. This means their confessions would be inadmissible in a fair court. That meant both police departments and the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department had to work much harder to find enough evidence to convict them. Marlowe would also recant his confessions later, changing his version of Novus's murder and completely denying any involvement in Murray's. That meant the pieces of evidence that they did have became more important, such as Kaufman's seized bag. The bag that Kaufman had contained 38 pieces of evidence in total, but the important items included a piece of paper that had Linnell Murray's signature written on it a few times, presumably for practice, a Phoenix, Arizona street map, a gun, and a silver metal earring with no back in a distinctive leaf shape. The detective examining the bag noted next to the earring that the mate to this earring was found on the ear of victim Linnell Murray. A batch of evidence had been sent to the Redlands police. It contained evidence from the cave where Marlowe and Kaufman had hidden overnight, the pillowcase that Marlowe had failed to throw out properly, and a makeup case from the Bavarian Lodge. In addition to Kaufman's makeup, the case contained five single earrings. During the autopsy of Karina Novis, some pertinent facts were found. Firstly, the fact that Novis had been anally raped. Neither of Marlowe's or Kaufman's stories account for this, nor were the different versions they tell over the years. She had some injuries that occurred prior to her death. Broken cartilage in her wrist, bruises and scrapes on her face where it was pushed into the dirt. According to the pathologist, dirt had not only made its way into her mouth between her lips and teeth, but it had been forced between the tongue and roof of her mouth. It was also noted that one of her earrings was missing. They say there are two sides to every story but the trial for the murder of Karina Novus had three. While the two separate defense teams pointed fingers at each other, the prosecution believed that the defendants were equally responsible for their crimes. Marlowe's legal team didn't even try to have him found not guilty, preferring instead to try and avoid the death penalty. They fought hard against Kaufman's team, who was using battered women syndrome to argue that Kaufman was not responsible for her actions. To me, this trial felt less about Karina Novus and more about Cynthia Kaufman. Every witness, every lawyer, and every objection seemed to revolve around this idea of proving or disproving whether she was abused or not. Karina, her life, and the bright future she had that was ripped away from her felt lost in the shuffle. It feels so pointless to read about, and I'm about to say something that's probably not going to go over well with everyone. 
I don't think it matters whether Kaufman was abused in this case. Now, I'm not saying abused partners can experience battered women's syndrome and thus be less responsible for the violence they do. But I think there's an edge. Killing your abuser because you can't take it anymore is one thing. Abducting, torturing, and murdering two women to save your skin is another. During these murders, by her own admission, Kaufman was armed, driving the car, and left alone for long periods. She had many chances to save these women, but she never took them. In addition, of the two, Kaufman was the one with suspiciously trophy-like things in her possession. There was no reason to steal one earring from the victims unless it was as a memento. In the end, the jury disbelieved Kaufman and Marlowe as well. They were convicted and sentenced to death. In the trial for the murder of Linnell Murray, Marlowe pled guilty and was given a second death sentence. Kaufman was convicted and given life in prison. Before we close the case for good, I do want to tell you all about some interesting testimony that came up in the case. Most of it is Kaufman-related because, as I said before, it seemed like the whole damn trial was about her. Firstly, though Kaufman's defense was that she was so afraid of Marlowe hurting her or her family that she did whatever he wanted, they wrote hundreds of sexually explicit, love-note-filled letters to each other while in jail. In one such letter, she had even drawn him a map of how to find her son. Which is just a strange thing to do, drawing a map so that the man you're terrified of can find the person that means the most to you. In the same letters, she expressed her appreciation to Marlowe when he told her that he would cover the tattoo on the end of his penis with her name. She admitted on the stand that she wanted to show her possession of Marlowe, just like he had shown his possession of her with his tattoo. Speaking of tattoos, Kaufman's defense would make a huge deal about the ass tattoo. They would say that it was a clear sign that Marlowe hated Kaufman, that he treated her like property. The prosecution, however, got her to admit that she had designed it and had asked Marlowe for a tattoo once before. Kaufman's star witness was a famous psychologist at the time, an expert on battered women's syndrome. Some of you may know of Dr. Lenore Walker because she apparently teamed up with Kim Kardashian to help abused women who were wrongly convicted. For the low, low price of 1500 bucks a day, she championed Kaufman's cause to the jury. She didn't help her cause much. As I told you, she ends up convicted with the death penalty. But we learned some interesting things like the fact that Kaufman had taken the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, or MMPI, before, and her test results were far different than the test administered by Dr. Walker. Another psychologist who examined Kaufman's tests said that they were where you would want to at least consider the possibility that a person might be exaggerating their symptoms. The single most interesting witness was a woman named Robin Long. After violating her parole, she ended up in jail with Kaufman for a month. During that time, Long used a scam she had picked up on the outside, where she pretended to read the future in playing cards. She'd tell people what they wanted to hear, and she'd get money in return. Kaufman became close to Long, and she told her everything about the crimes. When Robin mentioned mothers one time, Kaufman mentioned how Marlowe hated his. Robin asked whether their victims had looked like his mother, to which Kaufman replied, No, the last two didn't. Long had been told of Linnell Murray's murder, how, when Kaufman came back from going to the bank, she saw that Marlowe had taken a shower with Linnell, and she was enraged that he had done so without her. She forced them to take a shower again with her. After the shower, Kaufman had gone into the bathroom and torn a towel in half before dipping it in the tub. She tried to strangle Linnell Murray with it, but wasn't strong enough. Marlowe grabbed the other side, and they did the job together. Kaufman had even shown Long how she had twisted the torn towel to use it as a more effective ligature, and even demonstrated how she had strangled the girl using Robin as a stand-in. When Robin asked 
Kaufman's reason for killing these young women, she said, because you can't keep a witness alive. And when asked why the pair killed the woman after making them take showers, she said that Kaufman had told her Marlowe wanted a clean killing. Great, we got puns. I think the most memorable thing Kaufman said to Long was, You see how my eyes get? They get just like Greg's. I'm becoming part wolf, too. The most important thing about Long's testimony is that, unlike most jailhouse informants, she's a reliable witness. Robin Long had a third-grade reading level, so she had trouble reading newspapers, and she didn't watch television. She didn't even know who Cynthia Kaufman was when she met her. In addition, she received nothing for testifying except the joy of having her reputation destroyed on cross-examination. She didn't even want to testify and had to be tracked down and practically dragged to the stand. I found her very credible. As for Marlowe, his story only changed in one way on the stand. Now he had absolutely nothing to do with Novus or Marie's murder. When he buried Novus in a shallow grave in that grape vineyard, she hadn't been dead, and he'd left her head unburied so she could breathe. As to Murray, Kaufman had been her sole killer. After all, Marlowe had never killed anyone before he met Kaufman, right? This went down like a lead balloon. So Marlowe and Kaufman are given the death penalty, which is now pretty much a life sentence given the current laws in California. And they're locked up for life. Marlowe's even spent most of that in solitary confinement, afraid that Kaufman will somehow have him murdered. Now, it's probably a good time to talk about those crimes that didn't happen. So let's talk about Sandra Neary and Pamela Simmons. Sandra Neary was 32 when she was found dead in Costa Mesa, California. It was near the time of Linnell Murray's disappearance, and she had been strangled which was enough of a link to Marlowe and Kaufman to start the police wondering. Unfortunately, there was nothing that could link them to Neary's disappearance on October 11th of 1986. They tried to match their fingerprints to those found in her car that was left in a grocery parking lot, but they didn't match. Sandra left behind a husband and a baby daughter, unable to cope with his grief. Her husband died by suicide not long after. A year after Sandra's murder, almost to the day, a 26-year-old man named Patrick Pierce was arrested for the crime. He was put on trial and convicted of her murder, but would only serve six years for the crime. Pamela Simmons' case is still tragically unsolved, as far as I can tell. I could only find two articles that mentioned her by name, but the gist of her murder is as follows. Pamela was a radio station salesperson who disappeared in October from her home in Bullhead City, Arizona. She was later found dead in the desert. No information was released as to the cause of her death. The police found fingerprints on her car and quickly ruled out Kaufman and Marlowe, as her fingerprints didn't match. I have no idea whether there were any other suspects in this case. So, why do we keep getting this information spread out there? I'm not going to point fingers, but I saw several podcast transcripts talk about these two cases, as if they're officially linked to Marlowe and Kaufman. Where does this come from? I'm fairly certain the original misinformation is being spread by Murderpedia.org. On the pages for Kaufman and Marlowe, they list Neary and Simmons as victims. And the source for this is sketchy as hell. I'm not afraid to say that because I have facts to back me up. Neary's case was solved in 1987. Simmons' case was considered not connected by Bullhead City Police a short while after they checked the fingerprints. That was long before the Encyclopedia of Serial Killers was published in 1990. That's just shitty research. So, the moral of the story is always back up facts with multiple, credible sources. We owe it to victims like Sandra, and especially Pamela, whose case hasn't been solved yet. And that's all I have for you. Thank the gods we're done with this long case. I'm happy that I got to learn a lot of things from this experience, but I'm exhausted. 
I'll be happy when I don't have to think about this particular pair of garbage people for a while. I hope you enjoyed it, at least. I'm happy I was able to get it out a week early, as promised. The next episode will be in two weeks from the day this episode gets posted, so August 19th. Uh, Halloween season is coming up. If you'd like some Halloween-themed episodes during October, leave a comment on my socials. No matter what, I will always be absolutely ecstatic to hear from any of you. For those who don't know how to find my socials, links are in the details. Just click on my link tree. It's like the apocalypse outside right now. Please take care of yourselves. I'm wishing for all of your safety. Wherever you are, stay safe.